Good morning, SEC at home. It's a pleasure to be with you once again on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, I just hope that wherever you are, you've tuned in and you're just ready to be able to engage with the Word of God and to engage in worship today. Um, if you could also do us a favor really quickly is it would be amazing if you could just share this link whatever platform that you want to share it on if you want to take this link from facebook and then you know put it on your facebook wall or just send it to someone on your whatsapp group or wherever it may be just so that they can also participate of what's going on here today so they can also come together and worship the lord together um, if you're here with us for the very first time again a warm welcome to you this is sec at home and we just can't wait for you just to really just grab hold of this moment and just to be with us in this Right, in this moment, we're just going to go into a time of praise and worship. Amen. Glory. 
even as we say that you know what above all else we just want to follow your commandments and just for God to have his way Father we pray for your way oh God we thank you because you are here even right now oh God you are here you are here
Good morning, SEC. Special welcome to all those that are logging in for the very first time. Uh, perhaps you got this link through someone who shared with you. We are glad you are able to join us today for our service, online SSC Church at Home. Uh, we have been on a series, and today we are doing part five of God's Most Wanted List. And this morning I want to talk on the topic, the misunderstood. The misunderstood. My world guess is that one of the most asked questions throughout history, regardless of culture, has been this one. Why do bad things happen to good people? When we go through difficult times in our lives, that is almost always the first question we have on our lips. Whether we do it aloud or whether we think about it, it's still a question that bothers a lot of people. And that question is certainly at the heart of the life of the man we're going to talk about today, the man Job. But as Job learned, and hopefully we will learn today as we go through this uh, story, the reason is so hard to find an answer to that question. It's so hard. It's in, in most cases, we don't even get an answer for it. That's because it's not the right question to be asking in the first place. That's what Job found out. I'm going to read from the first chapter of the book of Job, and I'm reading from verse 1 through to 5. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one, of, each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job, for Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. The opening paragraph of the book of Job portrays Job as a very religious man. He's described as upright and blameless, and that he consistently goes through the spiritual ritual of giving sacrifices to God, bent offerings, as it were, in case his children might have cursed God. He was a righteous man. You will notice that in these first five verses, the name God is used twice. And in both cases it's used, uh, the name actually used is Elohim, which is a generic name for God. Now, so while Job is religious, this is about as far as his relationship with God seems to go at this point in his life. However, the story doesn't end there. Uh, how else can we describe what happened to Job? I cannot imagine what Job must have gone through. He lost all his earthly possessions. All his ten children died tragically. And his health failed. As if there was not enough, his relationship with his, those closest to him was tested to the hilt. And when he was in the midst of all this, I'm sure he couldn't understand any of it. What a heartbreaking experience this man would have gone through. But from the vantage point of eternity, Everything must have finally made sense to him. The only issue is, as we read the story, he was not yet at that vantage point. Some of you probably are somewhat familiar with the story of Job uh, and his journey. But let's review it together and see what we can learn along the way. Job was not only on God's most wanted list. Of all the characters we've done so far, we realize that they were on God's most wanted list. But Job 
there was a slight difference in that he was also on the devil's most desired list so it's not only god that wanted him on his list but it seems that the devil had an interest in job so let's look at some few things that we can pick from the story of job number one is that satan misunderstood job we read from the first chapter from verse 8 to 11 there is a conversation between the Lord and Satan. And God is saying to Satan, have you looked at Job? He's an upright man, blameless, shunning evil. And this is what the devil says in verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions. And his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. When God pointed out to Satan how Job was a righteous man shunning evil, Satan wanted to challenge God. As we read there, he says, if you, take, if you stretch out your hand, and touch all that he has, he will cast you to your face. He's talking to God. So Jake, Job became a target for Satan because God singled him out as a man who was blameless. It's as though God was proud of Job. This is a man that God wanted on his list because he was a blameless and a righteous man, he devoted to God. But you see, Satan only saw the blessings that Job received from God as something that he could worship, as something that he could lean on. So in devil's mind, he thought that if you take away the blessings from Job, Job will change on the inside. This is how the devil thought. He believed that he could prompt Job to curse God. So Satan came up with a theory that Job would curse God if he lost everything he had. And when Satan proposes this theory to God, God takes away his protection. And all those tragedies start happening to Job because the devil was behind that. But Job remained faithful to God even in the midst of all this loss and pain and grief. But Satan still convinced God that let's allow me to harm Job's body. Let me harm him physically. So God allowed him. And Satan covered Job from head to toe with sores. His whole body was filled with sores. The man was in continual pain. Emotionally and physically, Job was struggling. And yet in all this struggle and pain, Job remained standing firm, refusing to blame God. The mistake that Satan made was to believe that Job was defined by his possessions and not by his relationship with God. Satan thought that Job was controlled by external factors like success in his life. But Satan was wrong. He misunderstood Job because he underestimated his loyalty to God. He misunderstood him completely. He did not see the big picture. If he had been able to see what God saw, he would have seen that a man who was defined by his relationship with God rather than by his connections to things was unshakable. But the devil missed that picture. He failed to realize that no matter what he did to Job, nothing would destroy Job's commitment to God. Nothing could shake him from his love for God. And he will not come to a place where he will blame God. So Satan misunderstood Job because he underestimated this mortal man. And as I speak to you today, there are things that God has built into your life on the inside that you should protect and preserve. No matter how much pressure you are under, no matter how much suffering you are going through, they are things that are not for sale in your life. And Job knew that. There is a second point I want to highlight here. 
The second thing is that Job's wife misunderstood her husband's trust in God. Mrs. Lord, Mrs. Job looks at her husband. He's in pain. He's struggling. He's suffering. And then she says to her husband, verse 9 of Job chapter 2, Do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. This is what his wife says. Now, in addition to his physical illness and and grief, he then hears this from his wife who looks at her husband using a piece of broken pottery to scratch his itching sores. And Mrs. Job cannot take it no more. So she confronts her husband and in anger she says, are you still maintaining your integrity? Just kiss God and die. Put an end to your suffering. You don't need to take this you can put this to an end just by cursing God and dying. The problem was that Mrs. Job did not see what was on the inside of her husband. She thought that if Job got rid of God, then the suffering would disappear too. She did not understand it. She too was wrong about Job. Because Job would not even think about cursing God. Because Job was determined to not only cling to God, but also to accept the bad in life. Just as he had accepted the good, Job understood that even the bad too can be accepted. But he would not curse God. He was bigger on the inside than what you could see on the outside. And being bigger on the inside means that your attitude is better than your circumstances. Anyone can have a good attitude in good times. The real test is whether or not you are able to maintain a good attitude when everything seems to be going in the opposite direction, as we have read about Job. And Job's wife, to be fair to her, she tried. She tried, but she would not go far. She put everything into it, but she was overwhelmed by what was happening to her husband. As she saw him sitting on the top of a, an ash heap, scratching himself, something broke within her. Something built up within her, and she could not take it. And she said, just kiss God and die. You see, Job had no control over his circumstances. You could even say that his circumstances became as negative as they could get because of how successful he was. He became a target of the enemy because he was doing so many things right. How about that? But the one thing he always had control of throughout this whole period of pain and, and struggle and grief was his attitude. He chose it every morning he woke up he chose it every night he went to bed. In the bad times, as well as in the good times, Job chose a good attitude. Obviously, his wife misunderstood him. She just could not get it that how can a man who's in such pain still praise God? How can a man who's struggling day after day still worship God and refuse to curse God? She just could not get that. Many people have a good attitude when things are going well for them. But the few that choose to have a good attitude, even when on a bad day, these are those that have chosen to do so even when they don't feel like it. They have chosen to believe that their God is worth everything in them. They have chosen to rely on God instead of themselves. And these kind of people are those on God's most wanted list. There's another aspect I want to share today with you. Number three is that Job's friends did not understand what was happening to him. We read in chapter 2, from verse 11 to 13, Job had about had three friends. I want to, I'm not mentioning the fourth one. Maybe let's say three friends. One of his, the names of his friends, there was Eliphaz, there was Bildad, 
and then there was Zophar. They made an appointment together to go and uh, visit their friend Job and maybe even comfort him when they get there. And so in verse 12, the Bible says, when they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe and they threw dust over their heads towards the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no one speaking a word to him. For they saw that his pain was very great. Imagine what it would be like to see one of your good friends, someone you highly successful and someone you admire, you greatly admire, sitting on a garbage dump, sick, bloody, and grief-stricken. Imagine what will run through your mind. That is what the friends of Job found out that day when they visited him. They barely recognized him. But they could clearly see he was in misery. They could not understand what was happening to their friend. Their most successful friend. Their powerful friend. Wealthy friend. So they just sat there for seven days with no words to say. And then after seven days, they began to speak. Job's friends acted superior to him. They projected themselves as having answers to what they were witnessing. They started giving him theories and philosophies and views of what was happening to him or why what was happening was happening to him. They wanted to simply say to him, you must have done something wrong, Job, to go through this. Their belief system, which is what I'm interested in, their belief system strikes some knaves today because a lot of people do believe what these guys believed. And their belief system was anchored on the fact that no bad thing can happen to a righteous man. They believe that somehow righteous people are exempt from pain. They are exempt from bad health. They are exempt from tragedy. And not only tragedy, but righteous people are exempt from lack. They can't lack anything because God provides everything. So Job must have surely sinned greatly to go through the, the ordeal he went through. But that's not how life works. You and I know that there are human problems that we can't fix at a human level. You and I know that we know people that are struggling and yet they follow God. And in the end, they made Job feel worse instead of feeling better. Sometimes the best thing you can do when you have a friend that is going through a hard time is simple to weep with them. Sit there and weep with them and say nothing. But not so with Job's friends. They judged him. They judged him and gave so many philosophies that had nothing to do with what had happened in Job's life. I'm sure you have friends like that. I'm sure you do have friends that always have an answer to everything you're going through in your life. I'm sure you do have friends that seem to understand every circumstance in your life and they know how to interpret it. Job had them too. I'm sure you'll understand what Job was going through. In order to be bigger on the inside than on the outside, your character has to be bigger than your reputation. Job's reputation has gone, be had gone before him. We, we know that the Bible says he was a, a very great man. He was wealthy, probably the wealthiest man of that day. No one else on that part of the world possessed the kind of possessions this guy had. Can you imagine 3,000 comments? Uh, camels in those days were like the, the Rolls Royces of today. And he had 3,000 of them. Many servants waiting on him. His wealth was beyond his wildest dreams. He needed many servants to care for them. And yet he attracted the enemy. The enemy envied what he had. What I like about Job, however, is that all these blessings did not define the kind of man 
he was. Reputation is important, but character is more important than reputation. So Job's energy was exerted in building the men on the inside. There were qualities on the inside. As we read through the book of Job, you hear that he was a generous man. He was a joyful man. He was a man of gratitude, a man of faith, a man of love, a man who made a difference in people's lives. That's what he spent his energy investing in. He built himself on the inside, and that became the foundation for his life. If you like to be great in God's eyes, focus on building your character from within and let the reputation take care of itself. Make strong character your greatest goal. Because when chips are down, when you're going through a trying time in your life, it is your character that will remain. The foundation of character will hold you up and not your reputation. And here's the fourth thing I want to share about Job. Job at times did not understand himself. Job had many questions. When you go through the book, it's amazing how many questions he would ask himself or God or his friends. Some of the questions are from Job 7 verse 20. Job says, If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Chapter 10 verse 8 says, Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now destroy me? Will you now turn and destroy me? In Job 13, 23, Job says, How many wrongs and sins have I committed? Show me my offense and my sin. In short, Job wanted to know, why me? Like us, he wanted to know, why do bad things happen to good people? In this case, bad things happened in every area of Job's life and on every dimension you can think of. He lost everything he had. That was the first test. And secondly, he lost his family. As if that was not enough, he then lost his health. And fourthly, if God had not intervened, he would have lost his friends too. They didn't respect him no more. And as we read through the, the, the whole story, it's a long story, but as you read, the, you can't resist seeing that Job did grieve like we would grieve today. He was in shock. There were times when he, he would throw up in anger. There were times when he would go through episodes of despair. And there were times when he wanted to bargain with God. This was a man going through life. And we can identify with Job. And yet... This man was on God's most wanted list. He was misunderstood. So much that he himself misunderstood what was going on in his life. The worst part for Job was that Job felt this was all undeserved. He asked many questions that bothered him and could not get answers. He asked his friends questions that they could not answer. He ended up going up to God with his questions. And he would bombard God with all these questions. And yet in all this confusion, in all this despair, in all this pain, the Bible still maintains that Job did not sin against God. His response was, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That was his response. Yes, I'm grieving. Yes, I'm in shock. Yes, I'm angry with what's happening in my life. And Job will still say, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. No wonder Job was such a, a great man who was on God's most wanted list. 
Yes, Job struggled because he did not see the big picture. That's why he could not get an answer is he, or any answers from God because he could not see the big picture. When everything looked bleak, when everything had been taken away from him and there was nothing left for him to lean on, he couldn't even see how tomorrow would be better. He had lost hope. He couldn't even see how the future would turn out. He couldn't see an end to his suffering. In the midst of all this, he could see God. Every day he would look at the size of his problem and then look at the size of his God. And then his conclusion would be, even though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Because the size of his problem was smaller compared to the size of the God he worshipped. What is your situation today? What is the size of your problem? As David looked at the giant called Goliath and reflected on what God had done for him as he faced lions and bears, he realized that Goliath is actually a dwarf when compared to God. So here is the final point I want to share with you today. God saw the big picture of Job's life. The good news is that God saw the big picture. He always does. God sees the big picture of your life. From the very beginning, God was proud of Job. He mentioned him to the, to the devil because he was proud of Job. He had a big picture. He knew what was on the inside of Job. Job was a man of integrity. He was whole. He was consistent day in, day out. Here was a man who stood by his belief. Here was a man who walked his talk. Here was a man who stood for God. He was able to stay true to God and to himself, no matter what was thrown at him. The enemy threw sickness at him, he remained standing. The enemy threw loss at him, he remained standing. The enemy threw pain at him, he remained standing. The enemy tried all he could, and yet this man remained standing. His friend tried to preach to him. His wife said, curse God and die. And this man remained standing. Somehow God strengthened him because God sees the big picture of your life. The Bible says that people look at the outside, but God looks at the inside. This is what God did with, with Job. He knew him better than even Job knew himself. He saw the big picture because he could see Job on the inside. Other people saw Job's blessing, but God saw Job's unfailing devotion to him. Other people saw Job's love for his family, but as God looked at Job, he saw his unconditional love for him. Even the devil, as he looked at Job, he saw Job's fortune, but when God looked at Job, he saw a man that had strong faith. I want to ask you a question today. When God looks at you, what does he see? No matter what happens to you, in the worst of circumstances, in your darkest hour, when you have no answers, many questions, even though you are suffering greatly, I want you to always remember that God sees the big picture of your life. Be assured, God always has a future planned for us. We read in, in, in Job 42 that God blessed Job with double of everything he had. Maybe that's where that song comes from. That said, my God will double everything I have. I don't know. But what we read in the scriptures today is that Job's possessions were doubled because God had a big picture of Job's second half. The Bible says he had seven more sons. Three more daughters. Oh, those daughters. The Bible says they were the most beautiful girls in town. And God did not only give him beautiful children. He also granted him long life. 
The Bible says he was able to hold in his own hands his great, great, great grandchildren and bless them. God gave him more than he ever hoped for, more than he ever imagined. He, got, he was bigger and better in his second half of his life. All because he was a man of integrity who chose God over the things of the world. If you want God's best for your life, make that your goal to pursue God. To pursue God. Those are the kind of people that make it to God's most wanted list. I want to close with this today. You will notice that by the time we come to chapter 42 in the book of Job, something has obviously shifted in Job's life. Whereas in chapter 1, Job was referring to God as in a generic way, meaning God Elohim. This time round, the word he uses for God is that covenant name, covenant name of God, Yahweh. He acknowledges God's sovereignty. He acknowledges in verse 5 that I actually don't understand. But I like what he says. He says, I've heard you with my ears, and yet now I have seen you. My eyes have seen you. I now understand. I now have gone through a journey with you. You are a covenant-keeping God. My relationship with you is now deeper than when I started off with you in chapter 1. So it wasn't just an experience for nothing. Out of all that you went through, when Job came out on the other side, he was closer to God than where he started from. So I want to say this to you, that whenever you go through a trial, what matters most, and this is the lesson that Job learned, what matters most is not what you know, but it's who you know. And Job was able to acknowledge that I now know the Lord. Yes, I might not have understood. Yes, I might have spoken a lot. But I now know the Lord. I know that when I know God, my life can never be the same. Because my God understands my situation better than anybody else. He will not be questioned. He, will, he cannot be explained. But I know that is a purpose for my life. And that he has my good interest at heart. So I know that we live in the midst of a, of, 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 of a season where a lot of people are hurting because of what we've gone through as a people. And all of that, I understand that. No program can answer that. No person can answer that. There are no tailor-made answers for the kind of questions we have. But I want to say this to you. What we need is a relationship with God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Ultimately, the only thing that matters is our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we can trust Him, even in difficult times, He will sustain us. So as I come to a close, I want to pray this morning. My prayer, my encouragement to you is that if you're going through a personal trial of some kind, right now, Will you ask God to deepen your relationship with Him? Would you hold on and trust God to come through for you? Will you tell God that you want to seek Him more, even during this time of the pandemic, even through this time when you are isolated, when you feel alone, when you feel the pain, the grief of maybe you've lost loved ones, maybe you've lost a job, Maybe you've been destabilized by what's happening right now. You feel like you don't deserve what's happening in your life. Well, you're not alone. You're in good company today. Because Job will say to you, you're on God's most wanted list. And that ultimately, as you draw closer to God, you will understand. You begin to see the big picture. The Bible says, Take his yoke. His yoke is light. Learn from him. And he'll give you rest for your soul. So I want to pray with different ones today that are carrying heavy loads in their hearts. I'd like to pray with you. Father God, I pray. I ask that you may bless your people as you have blessed Job. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that you may help them to trust you 
in the midst of whatever trial they're going through right now. May you give them the peace that surpasses all understanding and the assurance that no matter what's happening in their lives, you see the big picture. You are still with them. Even though they may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with them because you are our shepherd. Yes, you are always there for them and you are with them today. I pray, my Lord, that you, they will always hold on to you and be unshakable in their commitment and devotion to you. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you today. I hope that God spoke to you. And I hope that as you come out from the, on the other end, you'll be a different person. You'll be able to rejoice and look back and say, my God is good all the time. May God bless you. Until we meet next week, may the peace of the Lord rest upon you. Goodbye. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Anderson Moyer, for the message today. Um, also, if you've just heard this message and you want to give your life to Christ or you want to respond or you just want to speak to someone about what you've heard today, please do follow the email address that we've actually put on put at the bottom of this video here. As well as if you want to call the number, somebody will be there on the other end of the line to be able to speak to you. And reach us to encourage you about what you've heard. Um, if there's any explanations that you want to have about what you heard or just want to know more about SEC, again, if you go through the email or you uh, go through the contact number, we'll be able to help you through that. On another note, if you are in the Sheffield area um, and you would require some assistance of some kind and you think that SEC could help you, please do reach out and then hopefully we'll be able to do something for you. Uh, for those of you who are part of the SC family, of course, you are welcome once again to be able to go to the Zoom uh, link that's being sent to the various groups and on this uh, Facebook link as well. So then we can also interact, we just have some fellowship, we can discuss what we've, had to, what we've heard today. Um, and then on top of that, the final announcement, I'll just give you a benediction actually. Um, and my benediction today is coming from 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy and i pray god your and i pray god your holy spirit and your and your body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ be blessed and see you again next time amen